everyone, I'm Shuli. Um, I'm the community leader for Hackaday. Um, and I just want to take this time to um, introduce um, our next speaker, Jesse Tank. Um, so Jesse, she is a electrical engineering student with over 20 years experience um, in IT experience. Um, she's worked with a large number of topics ranging from lasers, robotics, CPU, ar um, architectures, and retro video game uh, and, and computers. Yay, video games. Um, so uh, she recently founded a new robotics duo club at the University of Alaska, and she's been uh, featured in Popular Mechanics and um, several smaller periodicals and also on Hackaday. So let's give a round of applause to Jesse Tank. <laughs> All right. Give everybody a moment to sit down. <laughs> so, basically, my talk is on ternary computing. Um, but before I get into that, I, out of curiosity, I, I had a question for everybody here. Um, I want you all to think of a two-digit number between 1 and 50, where both digits are odd and they're not the same digit. Just out of curiosity. And does everybody pretty much have that? Now, what I want you to do is, if your uh, digit was 37, can you raise your hand? That's pretty cool. I was just, the reason for the question is, I was, I was just curious, um, statistically, most people do pick the number 37 for that. Um, and curiosity is pretty much why I do things. Uh, as she said earlier um, during the introduction, I built uh, lasers, I've dabbled in robotics and AI, and AI is what sort of got me into um, ternary computing. It's, uh, it fits really well with ternary um, because most people don't think in a on or off or black or white, they, they tend to think in shades of gray. And this is really touchy. Okay. Um, so why ternary? Well, most of the, the numbers are just as easy to, easy to represent as you would represent them in binary. It's just a base three. Um, so pretty much everything you've learned is still applicable. Um, to uh, ternary thinking. Um, it's extremely efficient. Uh, you can represent a number that would normally take um, 64 wires in a binary system and represent that same number with 27. So as you start um, building the system up, you can fit more data into the same amount of area. And someone pointed this out to me right before I was coming up here to speak. I guess uh, Donald Knuth said, perhaps the prettiest number system of all is the balanced ternary notation. And that's where you would represent a ternary number as a positive or a zero or a negative. So that's kind of cool. Uh, why did I select ternary? Um, it's because it happens to be one of the most efficient numbers to represent uh, numbers. Um, you basically are looking at something called uh, radix economy. And what radix economy is, is the number of, in a particular base, how many digits you need to represent any number. Um, you would get that, well, basically that formula. Uh, it's the number of digits needed to express multiplied by the base. And the most efficient radix out there to represent any number is actually base E. Now, building a system with a, a base E as your building block is kind of difficult. Um, so I went with the next closest, which was base 3. Uh, these are the efficiencies of uh, a number system. So as you can see, base E um, essentially works out is almost perfect. And when you look at binary, it, it ends up as uh, 1.06 versus ternary, which is 1.0046. So that means you can, uh, in a fewer number of essentially electrical signals, represent the same digits. Uh, and as you go up from um, ternary, uh, or from base E, 
it, uh, or from three, it starts getting much more inefficient. So when I started designing things in Ternary, um, I started using um, pencil and paper and using a binary encoding scheme and basic Carnot maps. Uh, is, who here is familiar with uh, Carnot mapping? Awesome. Uh, essentially what I had end up, ended up doing was uh, replacing, instead of a, a positive, I just used like a one zero, a, a zero, I'd use a zero zero or a one one. And for the uh, negative, I would use a zero one. And that allowed me to begin building if basic circuits so I could use them in um, open source software such as Logisim. So, let's see. We also uh, started deciding to try to roll our own programs. Uh, we did come up with a couple different solutions um, and adapting existing tools, which, like I said earlier, would have been Logisim. Uh, when we were rolling our own software, uh, this was a piece of software we called Synth. Uh, it allowed us to build a ternary uh, structure up and then after that, generate the truth table so we could see what, what the actual outcome of the circuit would be. Um, and this was designed so we could also do it uh, asynchronously as opposed to on the clock, so everything was in line. Um, just a couple of pictures, I guess. This was building up uh, a circuit. But what I kind of wanted to show you more was um, adapting existing tools. Now, as I said before, um, there are a lot of open source tools out there, so that's really cool. But the problem is, is not a lot of them are natively ternary, so you have to di deal with uh, a few quirks, such as encoding. Uh, the best way to go about that is to encode, and in these particular examples, I'm going to use the uh, encoding scheme where it's uh, 1, 0 is negative, 1, 1 is 0, and 0, 1 is positive. And there it goes. Um, when you look at, like, say, a simple ternary AND gate, uh, the truth tables over on the side there, but they're, they're very simple to construct in Logisim. But the nice thing is, is when you start looking, oh, um, these are these would be the the gates that I would consider to be the essentials in building a ternary system. Um, you have your AND gate, your ANY gate, which you don't really see a lot of, but um, it's extremely useful. Your standard OR gate, um, your decodes, uh, if it's false, true, or unknown. Basically what they do is they uh, just put a positive on the output if, if it happens to be one of the selected inputs. Um, you have your decrement, which, or your increment gates, which will be um, around Robin, and I'll upload these slides so if anybody wants to try experimenting with this on their own in Logisim, they can. Um, a switch gate, which is kind of like the, um, the decoding gates, except for instead of uh, zeros. Um, I think the other name you'll see on this is, uh, there's a gentleman that goes by the name of Douglas Joan. I think he calls it a clamp gate, but uh, what it does is it um, just outputs a negative uh, if the input was positive. And that's really useful when you're trying to build things. Um, pretty much everything you know in binary still holds true after you have those basic gates. For instance, if you've ever looked at building a NAND gate out of uh, a binary and you build the same gate in ternary, it will hold true. So it's not really a huge change in thinking, but you do get a much tighter data density overall. Um, it's basically, uh, let's see here. Oh, uh, comparison gate, and that's where you can see where, like, uh, the decodes. Uh, that would be essentially your if statement in programming. Uh, your standard mux and a dmux. Um, and when you start getting into things like building an ALU, you do need to 
of course, be able to add, subtract, multiply, divide, and all that. And this would be an example of a, a, a simple sum gate. So if you were going to build a, for instance, a ripple carry adder, uh, the thought process is pretty much the same. Um, you'd build a half adder. And then you could start just assembling it into a full ripple carry. Okay. Uh, let's see here. So why did I originally begin uh, developing into ternary? Um, well, one of the slides it missed apparently was uh, I had a few pictures of the, the long winters in Alaska. <laughs> uh, very little else to do when you're sitting there waiting for a computer to, to do its thing when you're doing a repair. So um, anyways, uh, the goal was to develop, develop a modern ternary computing system. The older systems that uh, have been developed for ternary, such as uh, Thomas Fowler developed a system for calculating tithes to a church, and that was back in the 1700s. That was a mechanical ternary system. Um, in the, I believe it was the former Soviet Union, uh, they developed a ternary system because they were cut off from most of the binary system that the rest of the world was using. And then it just went out of practice. And I was sitting there thinking about uh, why I would go ahead and build something like that. And it just came down to efficiency, and I was wondering why we weren't using a ternary type system. Um, so when I started doing it, I, I came and did a Hackaday presentation a couple of years ago, and I got a lot of feedback from that, and I got a lot of help. So we started banding together and putting together a fully functional ternary ALU. Um, the, the team, uh, someone decided to dub the team Jin. So we did a lot of experimenting. Uh, that's some of my earlier work when I was uh, playing around with, um, for instance, Muller gates and things like that, because we were doing uh, an asynchronous type system. And that's a picture of the first ternary based chip we had. Um, we got that from Moses. Uh, let's see if the gentleman was here that, I had one other person here that was from our team who, oh, there he is. Alex. <laughs> um, but he might be able to, if you have any questions, he, he actually dealt with, uh, was it Moses you dealt with directly? Yeah, okay. He might be able to answer a couple of those questions. If anybody wants to get into building a chip, uh, you're also doing something on Hackaday? Yeah, a Hackaday project about it. Um, so, basically, uh, Ternary is really well suited for things uh, such as AI, like I said earlier, because people don't think in an on and off situation. We tend to think in shades of gray. Um, so it, it more complements that. Uh, the systems that we've also been working on have been asynchronous. Uh, the, the reason for doing that is we're trying to bring down, uh, bring down energy and then uh, to optimize the performance on it. Uh, See internet things. All right. So the motivation for doing um, kind of this unorthodox design, uh, we we're trying to come up with a way of bringing a ternary product to the market to see if uh, we could make it a reality. Um, because it's not enough just to have a good idea and to build it, but you actually need to build it and then get it out there for people to use. Otherwise, it just it'll fade away. So um, we decided to come up with a ternary-based uh, application um, for the uh, Internet of Things world. So uh, it, um, let's see, basically um, Internet of Things is not generally centralized or it's not confined to servers, data centers. Uh, we're living in more of a mobile era. So the ternary concept that we came up with was pr um, along the lines of uh, miscomputing. Um, 
basically as computational needs are increasing, uh, we have to meet those demands, so it, it requires a few new ideas. And since everything is getting smaller, have, being able to compress your data into a smaller um, surface area on the die it just makes sense. So we've been working on a project called um, IOTA, or I-O-T-A, uh, that's a blockchain um, that uses a ternary hash. And that's the primary um, goal we've been working towards so far. Uh, it uh, enables microtransactions without fees. If you're familiar with how a blockchain works, um, you can trade exact amounts. You don't have to add an extra fee on top of it. And it allows multiple devices to share their computing power, just like uh, you'd normally have. In, um, but basically what it's looking for is a machine economy. Um, or as, well, my boss said, he said it was an economy of things. <laughs> um, so it, uh, it allows us to give ternary a physical use. We're still looking for some more uses, um, but that's the first one we're working on. Um, it, it sends its data in a ternary architecture, it trites instead of bytes. And anyways, we're still working on that. It's uh, mostly been developed. We have developed um, several other things, such as uh, in the base of uh, a ternary uh, ALU, we have a full functioning carry look ahead and um, all the other components going. But uh, we're still working on some of it at the moment. Uh, we're hoping to get uh, a product out here pretty soon. So, let's see. Oh, I guess he stuck that on the end. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, the economy of things. Um, how much? 13? Well, I'm running low on stuff to say here. So, I'll take questions if anyone has any. Thank you.